Good afternoon, and welcome to another edition of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy's Counterterrorism Lecture Series. I'm Aaron Zellin, the Gloria and Ken Levy Senior Fellow in the Reinhardt Program on Counterterrorism and Intelligence. Before beginning, I'd like to thank my colleagues, such as Devorah Margolin, who first spearheaded this event and also just came out with a new article about ISIS in Syria that you should all read on our website, um, as well as Matthew Levitt, who directs our CT program, and Dana Struhl, our new director of research. Big thanks also to our research assistants who helped plan this, Alana, Camille, and Delaney. Finally, I wanted to thank Corey and Katie for the tech setup, George for the editing assistance, and Carolina for the social media outreach. Five years after the Islamic State lost its territorial control in Syria, um, an enduring defeat has yet to be achieved. In Iraq, the organization may be at its weakest point since its inception, um, but it has continued a low-level insurgency next door in Syria uh, and is working to free tens of thousands of members and sympathizers still detained in prison and precariously situated in IDP camps. Further afield in its self-declared external provinces, uh, the group has seized new territories in Mali, Mozambique, and Somalia, as well as establishing external operations headquarters in Afghanistan for planning terrorist attacks abroad. What do these developments mean for the U.S.-led campaign to defeat the Islamic State? To discuss current challenges and next steps, the Washington Institute is pleased to introduce Ian McCary, who joined the State Department's Counterterrorism Bureau as the Deputy Special Envoy uh, to the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS in September uh, 2022. Previously, he served as the Charge of Affairs for the Afghanistan Affairs Unit in Qatar um, and Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Kabul. His distinguished Foreign Service uh, career also includes prominent posts in Pakistan, Tunisia, Iraq, Morocco, Egypt, Indonesia, and Saudi Arabia, among others. Following the Deputy uh, Special Envoy McCary's remarks, I'll be moderating a question and answer session to dig deeper into these topics. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Uh, and thanks to the Washington Institute uh, for hosting me here today. Uh, as Aaron mentioned, I sit in the State Department's Counterterrorism Bureau. Uh, and I'm currently serving as the Deputy Special Envoy to the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS. On March 23rd, 2019, almost exactly five years ago to the day, the coalition and its local partners liberated the final stretch of territory controlled by ISIS in Baghouz, Syria. This was and remains a milestone in our continued efforts to ensure that ISIS cannot resurge. We're here today to mark the fifth anniversary of this moment, the territorial defeat of ISIS, an accomplishment which continues to protect the United States and our allies and partners, and which has improved the lives of millions in the region. As we commemorate the fifth anniversary of the territorial defeat of ISIS, and as we also approach the coalition's upcoming 10th anniversary, I'd like to reflect today on four factors. First, how the United States led the formation of the coalition to defeat ISIS. Second, our progress over the past five years since the liberation of Baghouz. Third, the evolving nature of the ISIS threat. And fourth, I'd like to preview some of our thinking on where the coalition goes from here. Above all, I'd emphasize that as leaders of the coalition, we are clear-eyed about the continuing threat ISIS poses, and we remain highly engaged in this endeavor. I'm constantly impressed by the commitment uh, and determination of our allies and partners to achieve ISIS's enduring defeat, even as competing issues increasingly crowd the international agenda. We continue to see a real threat in Iraq and Syria, where ISIS at one point controlled a region with a population of approximately 10 million. And uh, we've seen the uh, emergence of ISIS affiliates, uh, the so-called uh, ISIS Khorasan inside Afghanistan, which poses an external threat, and in Sub-Saharan Africa, where multiple ISIS affiliates have emerged. I'll come back to the current state of the fight a little later, but let's reflect for a few minutes on the past 10 years. 
The Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS was formed in September 2014 with 12 original members. By December 2014, it had grown to 60 members. Today, the coalition includes 87 members, bringing together countries from every continent. Through coalition action, we achieved the territorial defeat of uh, ISIS in Iraq and Syria. We've eliminated or captured leadership on multiple occasions. We've significantly reduced ISIS's ability to carry out attacks in Iraq, Syria, and elsewhere. And through the coalition, the international community has invested billions of dollars in stabilizing and helping to revive liberated areas. This progress is a testament to the strength of the coalition and the courage of our partners on the ground. 2014 saw the precipitous fall of Mosul and the seizure of territory stretching from Northwest Syria to the outskirts of Baghdad. To push back, the international community came together to form our global coalition, and we created Combined Joint Task Force Operation Inherent Resolve, OIR, under coalition auspices. From its inception, our military response was robust. In its first year, OIR conducted over 8,000 airstrikes against ISIS targets in Iraq and Syria. Between 2014 and 2017, ISIS lost 95% of its territory. By uh, July 2017, Mosul was once again under the control of the Iraqi government. And by December 2017, ISIS had lost all control of territory in Iraq. The fight continued in Syria, where ISIS held on to strips of territory until 2019. When the coalition and partner forces reclaimed ISIS's final territorial stronghold in Baghuz, this was a decisive blow to an horrific terrorist organization, which had brutalized millions, but many challenges remained and new phases were to emerge. Since 2019, the coalition has continued to work assiduously toward the enduring defeat of ISIS and OIR remains in the region to advise, assist, and enable local partners. There's still much more to be done. The foremost line of effort continues to be in Iraq and Syria, where the coalition uh, continues, uh, is, excuse me, is promoting and coordinating stabilization assistance for liberated areas and their populations. With our partners, the coalition has had remarkable success in restoring stability to areas free from ISIS with a coordinated assistance following directly in the footsteps of military operations, restoring a sense of normalcy for millions of Syrians and Iraqis. However, there are still critical gaps in essential services, uh, food insecurity, intercommunal tension, tenuous security conditions, lack of op economic opportunity on the ground, and regime repression in areas still controlled by Assad. All of these factors fuel local grievances on which ISIS feeds and recruits. The coalition has provided hundreds of millions of dollars in stabilization assistance annually, adding up to billions of dollars invested over the past five years. This, this support meets critical needs that Syrians and Iraqis have themselves identified. It addresses vulnerabilities previously exploited by ISIS and closes gaps in local needs, including for essential services, education, community re reintegration, and accountability for ISIS's heinous crimes. In the past year alone, the coalition collectively pledged $597 million worth of stabilization assistance for liberated areas in Iraq and Syria almost reaching our $601 million target. In addition to this assistance, coalition partners have made notable progress in repatriating foreign terrorist fighters and associated family members that remain in Northeast Syria, reducing through repatriations the populations of displaced persons in camps like Al Hol, which has 43,000 people, and of course the detention centers holding nearly 9,000 ISIS fighters 
is essential to reducing the risk of an ISIS resurgence. In 2023, nearly 5,500 individuals were repatriated or returned to their countries of origin from Northeast Syria. This figure includes more than 4,000 Iraqis and individuals from 20 other countries. In February of this year, 99 displaced women and children from Al Hol and Al Roj camps returned home to Kyrgyzstan, enabling rehabilitative support and their reintegration into society. Though we're making progress on repatriations, we continue to call on governments to repatriate their nationals from Northeast Syria, because again, repatriations are our single most important tool for preventing an ISIS resurgence. And even as we've achieved su significant progress, the coalition has been adapting to keep pace with the evolving and increasingly diffused nature of the threat. Security situation throughout the Sahel and other parts of Africa has deteriorated significantly in the past several years. Increasingly frequent deadly attacks from ISIS affiliates have rav ravaged communities. Women and children have been kidnapped in the Lake Chad Basin. Soldiers attacked while guarding critical water infrastructure in Burkina Faso. Farmers ambushed in the DRC's North Kivu province. These are just a few of far too many examples. Today, Africa is the location of nearly half of the world's terrorism deaths. Approximately 60% of ISIS propaganda is coming out of Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly from ISIS affiliates in Nigeria, Democratic Republic of Congo, and Mozambique. The coalition's communications working group has been working continuously to advance collaboration and capacity building among member countries to defeat ISIS propaganda, recruitment, and radicalization efforts in Africa. The coalition's Africa focus group is crystallizing our focus on the terrorist threat in the region and improving coordination of CT assistance. In collaboration with our African partners, the Africa Focus Group developed a four-point action plan, which addresses first, capacity building, and specifically activities that promote border security, battlefield evidence preservation, and biometric collection. Second, countering ISIS propaganda while building community resilience. Third, improving partners' capacity to reduce illicit financing of terrorism, and fourth, countering malign influences and disinformation. The United States is supporting these efforts and has pledged $130 million to enhance civilian counterterrorism capacity in Sub-Saharan Africa, including over $22 million uh, in new funding for partnerships with coastal West Africa in the past year. At the same time, we remain vigilant against the threat posed by so-called ISIS Khorasan, or ISIS-K, emanating from Afghanistan. The Taliban have made progress combating ISIS-K, but they've still struggled to dismantle ISIS-K's clandestine urban cells and prevent attacks on soft targets. The coalition is determined to see that Afghanistan never again becomes a safe haven for terrorists. We're addressing the threat by increasing focus, coordination, and collaboration on ISIS-K with our coalition members and augmenting our cooperation with regional partners in South and Central Asia. Core components of the U.S. strategy to address, address the ISIS-K threat include strengthening law enforcement, border security assistance, capacity building, and rehabilitation and reintegration initiatives in Central and South Asia to better track and contain any spillover of ISIS-K. That is in concert with the positive impact of humanitarian and development assistance, especially for pop populations who remain susceptible to ISIS-K recruitment. Uh, the result is a collective effort of over $30 million in new counterterrorism programming for Central Asia coming on top of $50 million, we've already invested in capacity building in the region. An especially important front 
in the fight against ISIS is in the information space. ISIS leaders promised their followers an idealized state. In reality, they delivered a brutal, morally bankrupt dictatorship. The crimes against humanity ISIS carried out include mass murder and systemic sexual exploitation of women and children. Defectors and victims alike tell horror stories of their time under the caliphate. Even the family of the leader of ISIS at its apex, apex Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, disavowed his brutality, cowardice, and hypocrisy in front of millions of viewers in a recent TV interview. Documentation and exposure of the crimes committed by ISIS members and the false promises of this failed movement's leaders are some of the best tools we have to dismantle their ideology. The U.S. and our coalition partners continue to support many actors, including governments, journalists, civil society groups, and brave individuals carrying this work forward. In the final part of my remarks, I'd like to emphasize that our coalition will continue to evolve as the ISIS threat evolves. Iraq was a, forces, a focus country when ISIS emerged, and Iraq is playing a leading role in the coalition today. Iraq is a founding member of the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS, and its forces successfully liberated Iraqi territory from ISIS's grip. Our shared mission is succeeding. ISIS has been defeated territorially, and Iraqi forces are in a stronger position than they've ever been to suppress the remaining threat. To sustain our gains, we continue our commitment to Operation Inherent Resolve, the complementary NATO mission in Iraq, and to civilian-led counterterrorism capacity building. As we've noted publicly, the United States and the government of Iraq have begun discussions on how OIR will transition its mission to meet today's threat and ensure ISIS's en enduring defeat. Coalition partners are committed to this conversation and to helping Iraq consolidate its progress since the territorial defeat. We look forward to Iraq's continued contributions to our broader global lines of effort, including stabilization, counter messaging, and counter financing to achieve the enduring defeat of ISIS in the region and globally. In Syria, we will continue our collective response to the ISIS threat, in particular, the security, humanitarian, and counterterrorism concerns posed by the detention facilities and also the displaced persons camps. The United States continues to urge partners and allies to facilitate the re repatriation, rehabilitation, and reintegration of their nationals as quickly as possible and the Coalition Stabilization Working Group continues to coordinate sustained investment in humanitarian and stabilization sectors in Northeast Syria. Beyond Iraq and Syria, the Coalition is committed to ensuring that ISIS cannot thrive elsewhere in the world. We'll continue to address key lines of effort like capacity building in Sub-Saharan Africa and Central Asia, countering ISIS propaganda, dismantling its financial networks, ensuring foreign terrorist fighters are unable to re reach conflict zones, and stabilizing liberated areas. Today, we're commemorating the fifth anniversary of the territorial defeat of ISIS. We're also thinking about the 10th anniversary of the coalition, which we will mark in September. As we approach that milestone, all coalition members want to ensure that our work is streamlined, updated, and adapted to the changing physical and ideological battlefield. As the threat has evolved and grown more diffuse, we're looking at adjustments to our configuration to make sure we're postured to anticipate and counter future threats. When coalition ministers uh, gather for their annual meeting this fall, that challenge will top the agenda. So, those are my remarks. Uh, thank you, Aaron, again, for hosting me today and um, look forward to having some questions and answers with you and our, our friends. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, 
So before we uh, start the Q&A, for those online um, and on Zoom, if you would like to ask any questions um, during the event, please enter into the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And for those that are um, watching the Policy Forum, either on the website or on YouTube, feel free to email your questions to policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. Thank you. So you uh, discussed a lot of different topics related to IS, the coalition, and everything in, in between. Um, obviously, five years ago, um, you know, uh, the issue of the Islamic State was still at the top of the agenda of the U.S. government, of the international community. However, many things have changed in, 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 in the intervening time. Um, many started focusing on other terrorism-related issues, such as far-right extremism. Um, you know, the Russians uh, invaded uh Ukraine again to try and take over the entire country, not just Crimea. Um, and then most recently, we saw the October 7th uh, Hamas attack. Um, uh, should uh, the issue of the Islamic State, the coalition's work, still be a priority for the U.S. and the international community? How do you, how do you see this in, in the landscape of everything going on right now? Well, Aaron, uh, you're quite right that um, issues like um, Ukraine, uh, and uh, the conflict um, in uh, Gaza and the uh, war between Israel and Hamas, uh, among uh, various other um, uh, conflicts and challenges around the world, um, have been a challenge uh, for those of us uh, focusing on um, uh, our continuing fight against uh, ISIS and its affiliates. But um, I actually think that uh, there, well, first of all, it does need to remain a priority because um, as I just outlined in my remarks, there is still um, a very real threat out there. We still have um, uh, thousands of uh, detained ISIS fighters uh, who need to be um, uh, uh, housed uh, both um, securely and humanely. Uh, we have uh, tens of thousands of displaced persons, uh, especially in our whole camp. Uh, you've seen there's plenty of uh, reporting on uh, the situation in our whole, which is less than ideal. And one of the many challenges we have in our whole is uh, um, that the uh, ISIS ideology is still um, uh, circulating in there or there are attempts to uh, keep that ideology alive in there. And, um, uh, and not only in uh, the core region of Iraq and Syria, but um, uh, in other parts of the world, uh, in Afghanistan and Sub-Saharan Africa, we see uh, you know, uh, uh, very active affiliates uh, committing a lot of heinous crimes. And uh, this is having um, an impact uh, uh, on uh, populations in those areas uh, and on uh, broader global security. And I believe um, not. A, I believe that there is a consensus. Uh, I've seen that there is a consensus among the members of the global coalition that even as we face all of these other challenges, we do need to remain focused on this threat. And uh, my indicator for that is the ongoing engagement that we have with um, so many partner governments in the coalition. We had uh, over 50 ministers come to the last coalition ministerial in uh, Riyadh. Um, I think uh, we will continue to see high participation and high level participation in uh, the ministerial meetings and in our working group meetings. Uh, there's still a very broad commitment because I think there is still a shared recognition that uh, we can't afford to be complacent uh, with this danger, even as we're facing so many others. Sure. And sort of related to this, um, you know, since the October 7th attacks, we've seen ISIS as well as other jihadi groups trying to piggyback off of it, essentially. And, you know, if you look to history, uh, you know, with the 1967 war between Israel and its neighbors, 
Um, you saw that leading to a mobilization of Egyptians to eventually assassinate Anwar Sadat following the peace agreement between Israel and Egypt. And then just 20 years ago during the second intifada, you saw that while many were on the streets and, and mobilizing in support of Palestinians against Israel, a number of people then ended up mobilizing and joining up with Al Qaeda in Iraq or other networks in Afghanistan. How much do you worry about uh, the sort of medium to longer term consequences of what's going on between Israel and Hamas right now in terms of the long tail of this and how uh, you know ISIS could take advantage of it, whether it's within the region or even when you're thinking about sort of the homeland context within the U.S. or Europe? Yeah, well, um, that is an enormous concern. And I think you've seen other um, senior U.S. officials uh, talk about that publicly recently. Um, uh, we are very concerned because we are seeing um, indicators that uh, various uh, extremist movements, uh, as you suggest, um, are uh, uh, seeking opportunities to exploit um, uh, images coming out of uh, that conflict uh, to uh, incite uh, and recruit. And um, uh, we are observing that, you know, there's a clear potential uh, for more radicalization uh, among um, people who identify with uh, one side uh, in, that, in that conflict. And uh, we've also seen um, ISIS uh, propagandists uh, try to uh, exploit uh, this conflict, but they are actually limited by some certain parameters that they impose on themselves. They do not support uh, Palestinian nationalist movements. Uh, and I think a lot of their propaganda has been directed even more at Hamas than it has um, uh, at um, uh, Israel or the United States, because uh, this is a group that can't tolerate any uh, rivals, and uh, uh, they tend to uh, condemn Hamas as uh, as uh, um, they, I think they consider them apostates as well. So, uh, but the broader trend of um, uh, anger uh, and this the danger that some angry people will turn to violence uh, is a real one. And I think it's going to pose a challenge for us for many years to come. So um, in terms of the international sort of uh, scene right now, uh, five years ago, let alone almost 10 years ago when the global coalition first started, um, you didn't see as much about uh, power competition between the U S and other countries um, counterterrorism was obviously a greater focus, but in the last five years, a lot of resources for the U.S. government has been pushed towards uh, this issue. Um, how does the global coalition sort of navigate this, especially when you see issues in the Sahel region right now, as, as you discussed with uh, IS expansion in different parts of Africa, where there have been a number of coups in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger now, and yet that's led to a growth in the Islamic State as well as other Al Qaeda affiliates. How how does the global coalition sort of navigate this when Russia is trying to come in and sort of take part in these efforts uh, outside of the framework of sort of the global coalition? Yeah, well, you know, uh, to take Russia in particular, I mean, they have used counterterrorism as a pretext for um, interference. And uh, they were doing that, I think, uh, first or particularly in Syria. And we continue to see a very, very negative impact of uh, Russian involvement in Syria. Uh, the, the victims of that uh, are uh, ordinary Syrians. Uh, and uh, we're also seeing uh, similarly uh, very negative results from uh, Russia's increasing uh, interference uh, in uh, what's happening in sub-Saharan Africa, and particularly, as you mentioned, in those those Sahel states. Um, it's been very unfortunate to see uh, the coups and uh, the seizure of power by military leaders in these countries, because uh, as you suggested, uh, as we see these military uh, uh, leaders uh, 
displace um, democratically elected governments, we also see a spike in uh, uh, activity by violent extremist organizations. And we see, if you take Mali as an example, uh, large uh, uh, areas of territory that are no longer under the government's control and are instead controlled by violent extremist organizations. And that is, you know, there is a parallel between that and Russian involvement because the Russians, uh, as you know, have been um, making friends with these coup leaders uh, and offering themselves as an alternative. And uh, what we've seen very clearly is that the more African governments get involved with Wagner or post Wagner activities, the less stable their countries become and the worse off their um, the average people become. And the only people who benefit are um, violent extremist groups and I suppose uh, Russian mercenaries and their and their employers. Yeah. So in terms of the internal work of the global coalition uh, is, you know, a key part of your job is to keep everybody, you know, focused and cohesive. Um, what are you asking of the coalition partners five years after the collapse of IS's territorial control? Um, is it relate to contributing more funding for people, the acceleration of repatriations? Are there are other issues that we should be considering and to better understand what's going on now five years later? Yes. Well, that's a great question. And thanks for asking. Um, first of all, it's worth noting that uh, participation in the coalition is um, 100% voluntary and what um, coalition members contribute uh, to our collective efforts um, depends on them and their own decision making. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, we have seen uh, a sustained level of interest and engagement from our coalition partners, um, notwithstanding all of the other challenges uh, that they're facing. I'm thinking in particular of Europeans who are understandably very, very concerned about what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, but um, they continue to show up in a big way uh, for the coalition as well. And what we ask of those countries and of many other countries uh, in who are active in the coalition, including, by the way, many countries in the Middle East, is uh, to please come to the table, um, yes, with resources to support activities like um, stabilization, and to support uh, capacity building efforts in other parts of the world, um, uh, but also to please come to the table with your um, expertise, your knowledge, your ideas, and uh, it's truly a collective effort. And um, it's, a, it's a great example of international burden sharing, because we all uh, are united in this purpose that uh, none of our countries, even if there are many disagreements in many other areas, want to see ISIS consolidate or advance. They want to see ISIS vanquished. And that's, that's what we're all working towards. So moving to more specific questions related to particular countries and the challenges in those. In Iraq, you have the government in Baghdad, um, which has been clear that it wants the coalition out and also to sort of renegotiate the relationship with the U.S. to more one related to bilateral instead of via the coalition. Um, but, the, but the potential departure of the coalition comes with an end to significant resource investment um, in Iraq's post-IS recovery. More concerning is the messaging um, coming from uh, you know the administration that IS obviously con continues to remain a threat next door in Syria. How concerned are you that developments in Syria could threaten Iraq again? And do you think the coalition would come back to Iraq if ISIS becomes a real threat to Iraqi citizens again? Well, first of all, um, the talks that you refer to between the U.S. and Iraq um, are talks that are uh, building toward um, a gradual transition uh, from the current configuration to um, an enduring uh, and I think robust bilateral uh, security partnership. So. Um, uh, there's not a timeline for this. Uh, this process is going to be uh, conditions-based. Um, the coalition uh, in Iraq uh, has had a, a long and successful partnership uh, with the Iraqi government. It's natural that over time, 
uh, arrangements will transition. Um, and uh, we do uh, continue to see a lot of important contributions and leadership uh, uh, from uh, the Iraqi government to the coalition writ large um, and uh, ongoing daily co cooperation with Operation Inherent Resolve. Uh, there will be a transition um, over time and uh, I can't you know, get ahead of those negotiations and preview what the outcome is going to look like, uh, but we do believe that um, our Iraqi partners also, and perhaps more than anybody, uh, share our interest in, in ensuring that, that there is not an, Iraq, uh, an ISIS uh, resurgence. Um, and in terms of Syria, um, obviously uh, those two issues are intertwined um, and can't really be delinked. Uh, we do need to deal with them together. And we do have uh, uh, important uh, counterterrorism missions in Syria that are going to take um, uh, time to address. Uh, and so we're, uh, you know, continuing our discussions with the Iraqis um, and with our partners and with other stakeholders in the region. And um, I think we're going to find a way to ensure that um, uh, we can continue to improve uh, stability in the region and continue to suppress uh, any uh, ISIS resurgence there. So sort of following up on this issue, um, you know, my understanding outside of government is that if this uh, transition was made from a relationship with, that's predicated more on the global coalition to one where there's more of a bilateral bilateral security arrangement is that this would uh, create some legal issues vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. presence in Syria since the global coalition is there to assist the Iraqis to make sure there isn't this cross-border issue, as, as you noted, since they are very much linked. Um, but if it turns into a bilateral relationship instead of the coalition one, um, how, how does the U.S. then deal with uh, the Syria issue? Because, you know, the U.S. isn't invited there by the regime for obvious reasons. Um, is there any way that within this negotiation with the Iraqis that there could be some, um, you know, legal aspect of it that allows the U.S. to continue this to help out the Iraqis so it doesn't resurge in Iraq? Well, Aaron, honestly, there's a sort of... Um hypothetical aspect to your question that I can't really tackle directly, but I would say that, you know, it's certainly uh, part of um, our ongoing deliberations uh, uh, with our partners uh, uh, between our agencies um, and, uh, and with our Iraqi hosts. And it's certainly something uh, that we need to um, uh, uh, sort out because uh, we do not see um, the uh, CT challenges and the threat from Daesh or ISIS in Syria uh, just going away uh, in, the, in the near term. We're going to need to uh, sustain uh, efforts there uh, to resolve uh, the humanitarian questions to get as many people as possible out of Al Hol and the other camps and back to their countries of origin and also get as many of those detained fighters as possible uh, out of Northeast Syria and back to their countries of origin. And for those who are remaining in, in Al Hol, because they don't have a safe place to go right now, uh, we are steadily working to uh, improve security and conditions for them uh, and improve uh, and expand accesses, access for um health and education and the many other needs that people have in those camps. Uh, and, uh, and again, uh, to uh, uh, ensure that um, uh, detained fighters are housed uh, securely and safely. Speaking of which, the U.S.'s main partner in Syria remains the Syrian Democratic Forces. What are you hearing from them now five years after the fall of IS's territorial control there and um, is this still their top priority also in light of the continued Turkish attacks against the SDF and their own security concerns related to this? 
Um, and, and do you suspect that they would be con- continuing to do this if there was a scenario where the U.S. left? Well, our work um, with our partners on the ground in Syria is predicated on the counter ISIS mission. Uh, and our partners on the ground have proven that they're extremely effective in prosecuting the fight against ISIS. Uh, and uh, counter ISIS missions uh, are continuing and uh, need to continue. And I think our partners on the ground also understand that this is our priority and uh, our relationship is predicated on that. Uh, do they have um, other interests and concerns and aspirations? Uh, I think they probably do, but that is not an aspect of our relationship with them. And that's, you know, the other parts of that are not really for us to determine. Sure. Um, so speaking of uh, these, this potential complication is, um, you know, Turkey is a part of the global coalition and they actually have had some of the most acute issues related to ISIS in their own country, um, having had more than 80 arrests now related to ISIS in the last year. Um, and if you want to find more about this, you can look at the Islamic State Select Worldwide Activity Map that the Washington Institute's created, which has tracked that with Turkey as well as anything globally. Um, uh, but they obviously have a different view of the SDF. How do, how do you work with Turkey in relation to this since they obviously want to combat ISIS in their own country, but based off of what they've been doing with the SDF, that's sort of maybe taken some resources away from the fight against ISIS within Syria? Well, as you say, uh, uh, Turkey is a major stakeholder in this entire issue. Uh, they also have suffered greatly from the ISIS presence in Syria. They have a long, uh, tricky border with a very unstable country. Uh, the Syrian war, civil war, has caused millions of Syrians to flow into Turkey, and I think millions of them are still there. Uh, so you can't really get your arms around this uh, problem without factoring in Turkey and its priorities and concerns. Uh, they have uh, very legitimate concerns about their own security uh, and the security of their public, uh, both from ISIS and also from the PKK, which has attacked them repeatedly. Uh, and we need to factor all of that in, in our conversations with them. Uh, we uh, have a great deal of common ground with Turkey and agree with them on a great number of counterterrorism issues and many other issues. We also have differences with them, but uh, we continue to talk about them. We've had a uh, uh, very high level uh, and successful visit of a, a Turkish delegation here in Washington just two weeks ago. Um, and uh, we hashed through uh, both um, our many areas of uh, common ground um, and uh, talked about areas where we have different perspectives. And I think that conversation is going to continue. And it's another example of something where we're going to have to navigate um, uh, 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 tricky waters because um, there's not uh, an, an easy answer to this. So building on that, um, we've seen recently uh, the agreement between uh, Turkey and Iraq related to the security agreement vis-a-vis um, -vis the PKK. Um, is Turkey a potential plan B option to dealing with the ISIS threat within Syria if the coalition relationship changes to one of a bilateral relationship with Iraq, um, since they're more of a capable state than what the SDF has been able to do more recently? Well, I would just go back to what I said before. We need to work with Turkey. We need to find ways um, we can uh, uh, work with them on this issue and in this and in this particular question. We need to find ways, uh, uh, areas of common ground, and uh, mitigate and and uh, 
uh, minimize uh, areas of difference between us. I think we're we're going to continue to have some disagreements, but we need to we need to find uh, ways to get around it. With regard to the PKK, uh, they are a designated foreign terrorist organization in the United States. Uh, they are sanctioned. They are unacceptable uh, to us. Their uh, repeated attacks on Turkey are unacceptable. And um, if uh, Turkey and Iraq uh, want to find a way forward on that, then you know I think that's uh, that's up to the two countries. Great. Um, moving on to a different part of the world outside of sort of the core territories of Iraq and Syria, where ISIS has operated over the last you know ten plus years now. Um, the biggest sort of global security threat now in many ways is coming from Afghanistan with the Islamic State Khorasan province, where we've seen now that just in the last year, they've either plotted or successfully done 21 attacks um, outside of their area of operation, whether it's, you know, plotting in India, attacking in uh, Iran and Turkey, plotting in Tajikistan. And more recently, you've seen a lot of plots in Europe, especially in um, Germany. How, how does the global coalition navigate this issue? Because a lot of it's more about probably law enforcement and intelligence sharing than purely, you know, uh, counter uh, insurgency or counter terrorism, especially now that, you know, uh, the Taliban is in control of Afghanistan now versus, you know, prior to three plus years ago, the U.S. was working with the Afghan Republic, which was part of the coalition. While well, you put your finger on a great number of challenges in tackling um, so-called ISIS Khorasan, but um, yes, uh, we are very focused on this in the coalition. Coalition partners are very concerned about this because uh, we know very well, uh, as you gave some examples, uh, that ISIS Khorasan uh, doesn't only want to blow up uh, maternity hospitals uh, and uh, schools um, and kill um, women and children inside Afghanistan. They aspire to uh, conduct uh, brutal acts of mayhem uh, outside of Afghanistan as well. Uh, they have a very nihilistic um, uh, vision. And um, uh, so it's another case where collective action is needed. And so we do have um, uh, detailed conversations uh, in coalition fora uh, where we um, exchange uh, information, uh, exchange uh, best practices uh, in uh, border security, uh, compare uh, trends that we've observed uh, in attacks, in movements, um, in propaganda, and compare uh, best practices uh, and finance, I should say, and compare uh, best pra practices for for taking all of these um, all of these challenges on. Uh, we're uh, particularly um, working closely with um, Central Asian states uh, bordering Afghanistan, um, which uh, share our concern about this. They've seen ISIS Khorasan using. Uh, uh, propaganda in local languages, seeking to recruit and incite from inside their countries. Um, we've seen ISIS Khorasan expanded into Pakistan, and that is uh, part of our discussions with Pakistan and uh, trying to um, find uh, 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 and finding, and I should say, various ways uh, to beef up our cooperation with them. But as you say, it's a lot more complicated with the Taliban in power. Uh, they are not a counter-terrorism partner of ours. And uh, it makes everything um, uh, a bit more challenging. But there is a great deal of vigilance and attention and resources being directed at that threat. Moving to a different part of the world, um, in the last five years, we've seen a real growth in IS activity and operations in various parts of the African um, continent. How successful has the coalition been at sort of building partnerships to counter IS in Africa? I know that a number of African countries have actually joined the coalition in recent years, but have there been any challenges related to this as well? Well, a short answer is yes, 
uh, there have been challenges. Um, the first and foremost of these challenges uh, we talked about earlier, uh, the uh, coups. Um, it's been particularly disappointing, uh, I think, to see what's happened in Niger, because Niger was um, really a premier uh, counterterrorism partner and was playing a leadership role inside our coalition. In fact, uh, the government of Niger hosted a very successful um, Africa focus group meeting that we had uh, just about a year ago uh, in Niamey. Um, and that, by the way, brought together a lot of African partners. And it was at that event that we built out and ratified the uh, Africa focus group action plan that I referred to in my remarks. Um, so uh, losing Niger as a partner has been a challenge. Um, and similarly, uh, the legal restrictions of having coup governments with in Mali and Burkina Faso uh, make it very difficult for us to do um, a lot beyond humanitarian assistance uh, in um, those other uh, coup countries. Uh, and um, it's no coincidence then that uh, there is an increasing focus now on coastal West Africa. And um, we are uh, talking to our African partners in coastal West Africa um, both bilaterally and through coalition fora and um, uh, directing more assistance that way. I, I mentioned in my remarks, uh, there has already been a substantial uh, counterterrorism investment by the United States uh, to build up capacities in coastal West African states. Uh, and our partners are interested in doing more. And there's a very active conversation going on now within the coalition about um, uh, how we can augment our CT assistance to um, uh, the coastal West African states and help set up a sort of firewall uh, to ensure that the instability we're seeing in Mali, Burkina Faso, uh, and Niger doesn't uh, bleed south uh, into these um, states on the Gulf of Guinea. Related to this and also connecting back to some of our prior discussion, um, you know, if uh, the relationship between the U.S. and Iraq does change. Um, would there be thoughts on the sort of ba basis of where the you know coalition is maybe you know articulated out of be moved to a country like Nigeria, which you know is a key U.S. partner, but also has had the most violence related to ISIS over the last few years? Instead of it being sort of you know, maybe viewed as based out of Iraq as it has been the last 10 years. Is, is that something anybody's been thinking about recently? Well, I think um, we are moving towards um, focusing. I mentioned in my remarks that the threat is becoming more diffuse, and this is a classic example of it. We need to keep our eye on the ball in Syria and Iraq, where there's where it all started and where there's still um, a lot of... Uh, uh, unsettled business, but uh, we also need to focus more intently um, on Africa. One important difference, of course, is that uh, in uh, Iraq and Syria, uh, we had um, a very robust and successful kinetic military operation, and there is no contemplation of uh, something like that in Africa. Instead, the focus is on capacity building with our partners and helping our partners uh, acquire uh, the tools uh, that and resources that they need uh, to defend their own sovereignty and defend their own publics against against uh, the ISIS affiliates there um, and other violent extremist organizations. By the way, um, uh, I don't think that you know we're in a position where we have to choose where is our center of gravity and where you know we we're pivoting from Iraq to Africa, um, I think uh, there is sufficient will and um, attention on both issues. And we're going to continue as we have been uh, to uh, focus on both those issues and the threat from ISIS Horasan. Um, uh, however, as the situation evolves, I mentioned in my remarks, we are evolving too. So we are looking at our working groups, looking at our meetings tempo, looking at our structures, 
And um, considering, you know, uh, what do we need to recalibrate anything? Do we need to uh, shift focus here or there a bit? And that's a conversation we started having with our partners. Um, and I think it will continue on uh, up until the ministers meet uh, later this year. Besides um, the issues related to IS in Nigeria or in, in the Sahel region, we've also seen, you know, a, a growth of the group in uh, Mozambique in, in recent years, and they've been very active again in, in the last month or two. Um, but I noticed on, on the coalition website that Mozambique, as well as a number of countries operating there to fight against ISIS, are not part of the coalition. Have has the coalition uh, tried to reach out to Mozambique or Rwanda, who's been a key partner of Mozambique in fighting ISIS, as well as the Southern African development community about potentially becoming a part of this broader um, coalition so that everybody can work together maybe? Yeah, well, so far, I think all of the CT discussions that have been um, happening uh, with um, uh, those countries are happening uh, bilaterally. Um, rather than the coalition, um, we have not been uh, approached by those countries. And I think our assessment is that those countries um, don't necessarily uh, want to join right now. Um, but uh, obviously, it's very important that we continue. We're, well, we're following the situation, uh, definitely, in northern Mozambique with a great deal of concern. Uh, and we've discussed it with uh, other African partners. Uh, we had a very useful visit to Kenya recently and talked about the threat of um, ISIS affiliates uh, across, um, across East Africa. And it's something that we're watching. And I think we do, we would like to improve and expand our counterterrorism cooperation uh, with Mozambique in particular. Great. Um, we only have a few more minutes left. But um, I'll ask uh, another question to get back to maybe more of a general view on some of the activities of, of the coalition. Can you speak to the current efforts related to countering IS financing uh, via the counter IS finance group within the coalition and how that's going? You know, I've, I've seen, at least in the U.S. context, that in the last five years, um, there's been less designations against um, IS uh, leaders in different parts of the world, and there maybe have been in the five years prior to that. So how, how is that all working out? Well, actually, the counter ISIS uh, finance group, uh, the SIFG, um, is very active. Um, it convenes twice a year, uh, had its most recent meeting at the end of January. Um, and uh, But in between the meetings, there is a constant uh, flow of information and exchange between the members of the uh, SIFG. The SIFG is co-chaired by the United States, uh, Saudi Arabia, which by the way, has a great deal of experience and expertise in countering terror finance, uh, and Italy. Uh, and through the co-chairs, um, we are seeing a lot of um, exchanges of information, uh, I, uh, detection of suspicious transactions, uh, de detection of suspicious accounts, um, and a lot of technical cooperation and um, uh, uh, capacity building opportunities. Um, it, it's, uh, it can be a, a particular challenge uh, when, uh, uh, especially in a place like Africa where a lot of the uh, money is moving, you know, the, the currency is not dollars, dollars, but cattle uh, or something like that, it can make it especially challenging. But there is a very active effort um, to find ways uh, to um, disrupt financial networks uh, in Africa and and the Al Qurar office. I mean, it, it, we know what happened with um, uh, Bilal al Sudani, uh, the head of the Al Qurar office, and the Al Qurar office uh, was a very important uh, nexus for ISIS finances. And um, we're continuing to uh, work really hard um, with our partners and uh, using all uh, means and sources available to us to detect and disrupt financial networks. Great. Thank you. Um, myself, as well as everybody at the Washington Institute, want to thank you again for taking the time. Obviously, even if 
ISIS no longer is sort of at the top of the policy agenda. There's still a lot going on related to the group itself in terms of its own activities, as well as the work of the global coalition to fight it. Um, so hopefully today would, is useful to everybody uh, watching this online um, and better understanding where things are five years after the fall of ISIS territorial control in Syria. Um, so thanks again, and I hope everybody has a good rest of their day. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron.